Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to uh, this second um, annual lecture for the Centre for Digital Anthropology. My name is um, Hannah Knox, I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology uh, and Director of the Centre for Digital Anthropology here at UCL. Um, and so I'm going to just say a little bit about the Centre for Digital Anthropology um, before going on to uh, introduce our speaker. And I'm also just going to talk a little bit about some housekeeping things before we start. So um, the Centre for Digital Anthropology was set up in 2009. And last year we had a 10 year anniversary um, kind of celebration and our first um, annual lecture, which we launched, we launched the annual lecture series last year in March. And our hope was to have our second annual lecture with um, Morton Pedersen, who is here with us today, this March. Um, but it was scuppered, as so many events have been, by um, COVID. So we postponed it to October in the hope that we would be able to have a face-to-face -face seminar, but clearly that wasn't going to be possible. So we've decided to hold it online and hopefully um, Morton will be able to come over to UCL and visit us um, at some point soon. Um, but one advantage of having shifted this uh, webinar, this seminar online, um, it means that I think many more people are probably going to be able to come. We've got um, nearly 400 people signed up to it, so we'll see how many people actually um, turn up. So as well as being the annual lecture for the Centre for Digital Anthropology, this is also um, the first of our seminar series that we run at UCL as part of our group in material, visual and digital culture. Um, and so, as well as having an online presence, we've also got um, some of our master's students and PhD students and staff who come along to the material, visual and digital culture seminars in the department. Uh, what, and you can probably see them on the screen there. So that's who the people are in the seminar room. Um, so that's really nice, but it's also a bit of a challenge as we try to work out how to have a seminar, how to have an annual lecture that's both uh, in person and online. So bear with us in, uh, in terms of the, um, in terms of the technology. So we've got um, two um, members of staff in the room, Maria and Heidi, who are, uh, who I think you'll see during the questions, um, but I'll leave them to have the video facing the seminar room at the moment. So in order to um, enable people both from the seminar room and who are watching online to ask questions, we've signed up to um, a website called Slido and if you go to slido.com and you put in the code for this talk which is and it has disappeared from my thing um hang on just one second so yeah the code for this talk is hashtag r304 you should be able to pose questions um, during the seminar or afterwards. And we're gonna collate those questions and we will ask them on your behalf and we'll say who it is who's, who has posed the question. Um, and we've also created a um, hashtag for Twitter, which is hash digianth2020. So if anyone's on a Twitter enthusiast and wants to tweet anything about this seminar, uh, you can use that hashtag. That's ha hash digianth2020. Okay, I think that's all the housekeeping things. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to introduce our um, annual lecture speaker for 2020, Professor um, Morton Axel Pedersen. Um, so Professor uh, Morton P uh, Axel Pedersen is Professor of Anthropology at Copenhagen University, and he's also a um, Co-PI, a uh, principal investigator in the Copenhagen Center for Social Data Science. Now, Morton has many strings to his bow and has um, studied various different topics within anthropology. He established himself as an anthropologist through fieldwork conducted in Mongolia for two decades and has um, two books which came out of that research as well as many uh, journal publications. The two books being Not Quite Shamans, Spirit Worlds and Political Lives that was published in 2011 by Cornell University Press and more recently just published last year Urban Hunters Dealing and Dreaming in Times of Transition which was published with Lars Hoer. 
Um, another one of his books, which might be of interest to people here in the anthropology department, was co-published with our very own head of department, Martin Holgrad, um, and that was the book, The Ontological Turn, that was published in 2017. But for the past five years, Morton has turned his attention to research in Denmark, and I think it's this work that has really brought, brought him here to the Centre for Digital Anthropology. And in that work in Denmark, he's turned his attention to um, the collaborations and the possibility of collaborations between anthropology and data science. So thinking about developing the idea of quali quantitative methods, computational anthropology, um, and thinking about the role of anthropology in data ethics and politics. And he was recently awarded a European Research Council grant called Distract, the political economy of distraction in a digitized Denmark. So like all of us, I think that uh, as far as I understand, this project has had to kind of reorient itself towards the COVID-19 pandemic that we find ourselves in. Um, and so today we're going to hear about the Distract project, but we're also going to hear about how Morton is applying this mix of data science and anthropology to starting to understand um, the dynamics of COVID-19. So I will hand over now um, to Morton, who I'm absolutely delighted is our annual lecture speaker for this year. Thank you very much, Hannah, and all of you for attending this. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be invited. It sounds like a really cool tradition with these annual lectures. And actually, I quite like the fact that we're doing this sort of like in a sort of mixed uh, in real life and on, off, on and offline format, because it does mean that more people can uh, participate. So uh, is this the moment I should share my screen, Hannah? Yeah. I will do that. Um, so basically, um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, computational anthropology uh, approach that I'm trying to develop. Some might say it's just a smart word for a new form of mixed methods or digital methods. We can discuss that. The way I'm going to do it is uh, I'm going to talk to the, for the first sort of half of this talk uh, as a general framing, what I think computational anthropology might be, how anthropology is, should be and might be related to data science and related quantitative approaches. And I'm also going to introduce this project called Distract that uh, Hannah just uh, uh, mentioned. And then I think we'll have a short sort of break. Uh, people can maybe ask a, a sort of couple of clarification questions, or simply just stretch their legs. And then for the remaining half of the period, of the next sort of 25 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce like three examples of this sort of COVID-19 research that we have been doing over the last three or four or six months uh, in relation to, partly and at least in relation to the distract project. But as a sort of general framing, um, the, 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 the Copenhagen Center for Social Data Science is basically where I am. I'm a vice director of this place. It's a place that collects or, uh, or puts together people from anthropology, economics, physics, psychology, and everything in between those. We do uh, also, we are, play a major role in a new degree program, a master's program in social data science here at the, the Faculty of Social Science in Copenhagen. So, it's a really nice place to be and it's a lot of people who are just trying to forge what we sort of when we are in our most sort of grand uh, thinking mood uh, mood think is actually a new discipline from 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 scratch but of course all disciplines come from somewhere and they bring together certain aspects with them including the people involved in them such as uh, anthropology and that's basically what i'm interested in at least in the in the current lecture but basically what we're trying to get at at sodas is and uh, also in the new degree program is a uh, it's a sort of symmetrical uh, move where we sort of try to bring together two often separate strands. What something that might be called, be called computational social science, which is a quite big thing in, in various sociology departments in the US and also increasingly so in Europe. That is really a sort of like a, a, a sort of way of beefing up traditional quantitative social science with data science approaches, such called sometimes called social physics. And on the other hand, we have something that might be fami more familiar to many of you, the other strand which is like, you know, various ways of doing ethnography, online, the, the wider field of digital humanities and, and you know, the, the, the more specific methodology component that you could call digital methods with all the different sort of more or less qualitative, more or less uh, mixed methods that are involved in those digital methods. And of course, we are essentially trying to, in a symmetrical way to bring this together. And symmetrical, I mean that we try to take equally seriously 
the possibilities and of course the limitations of the different epistemologies, approaches, uh, data forms, etc., involved in these two strands of, uh, of ways of doing digital research. Um, the background of my own in, involvement in, in SODAS and this kind of work is like around six, seven years ago, we got a lot of money, uh, sort of sense of excellence, uh, uh, where we, together with the physicist, who received his own batch of money, uh, bought 1,000 uh, phones, smartphones, and handed it out to a whole cohort of first-year students at a Danish engineering school. They got these uh, phones for, if you like, free, but as we all know, like uh, when, when something is free, it simply means that you are the product. So they, of course, assigned onto, and we were told that we were going to get all their data, and not content data, not the content of their messages, but who they messaged it to and where they were in terms of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, upcomings. At the same time, we embedded, as we like to call it, a, a PhD student of anthropology in this population of students so that during the one year, she basically studied the same questions as we did by using the sensor data from another angle, namely, what is the nature of social networks and friendships among a, first, uh, a cohort of first year students at a Danish uh, uh, engineering school? And all sorts of papers have come out of that, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail about here, but you know, you, you can get in touch with me if you want to hear about it. This is when the, the phones were about to be distributed some of the sort of like uh, preliminary sort of like essentially plots uh, that could be shown uh, often based sort of a minute temporal uh, uh, plots of where people were, how much they used the phones, etc. And who they were, what fo who, which phones, their own phones were closest to over time, etc, etc. And one thing uh, within this wider project, we had something that we called the Ant Sock team. Uh, and one of the sort of like experiments or data sprints we did was that we got together for a week and we asked, can we say something new about what a social atmosphere is or specifically what a good party atmosphere is? <laughs> and we came up with this idea because the PhD student who had been doing her fieldwork uh, in the student population, one of the things that she had realized and her thesis also ended up being very much about this was that uh, the sort of sociality uh, uh, of, of uh, the student sociality was an integrated part of the, the sort of like competences that these engineering degree uh, students that they learn because it's so collaborative also the kind of work they do afterwards when they go out and get jobs. So she participated in numerous uh, hundreds of parties perhaps during that year and we asked her then to say what was the best party that you participate in according to your memory, your field notes or whatever kinds of data you have. And then we asked her to read out those field notes for us. And then we basically got together and we accessed the database and tried to find her phone and her in the particular party in the data set. And what we then did was to sort of like, you know, if you like, try to quantify what a social atmosphere is, you know, in as much as that can be done. At least what we did for sure was we tried to essentially see whether we could in some sort of sense mix and integrate uh, the, the very sort of traditional, if you like, uh, fieldwork based uh, notes that she had made in uh, during this party and also her other wider contextual knowledge about this group and the pro degree program in Denmark and what whatnot with this very sort of like um, fine grain quantitative sensor data that basically like came out of the fact that when a Bluetooth signal, uh, when the phone is on Bluetooth, every five minutes it traces its distance to other open Bluetooth signals, which then would allow us, as you see here, to sort of try to say, at what time during a, this particular party were people closest to one another in the biggest groups? And you know, we did a lot of uh, sort of quite experimental stuff around that, and we published a paper on it uh, in Big Data and Society, and some journalists also got in touch with me and wanted to hear whether it was true that these researchers had found the recipe for a good party, which is what it says in this headline there. Uh, and that was basically sort of the beginning of, uh, of this, uh, my, my engagement with this, uh, with this field. But if we now turn to the sort of more general question of where's anthropology positioned in relationship to big data, if you want to call it that, or the sort of data, data in saturated world that we all find ourselves in both scholarly and and in the, the rest of our lives I think that it's quite useful maybe to distinguish between three different kind of strategies and one is what you call the anthropology of big data 
uh, is probably one could say the most widespread so far. Uh, a lot of anthropologists have done really important work going out and studying data scientists and the data scientist deployments and governance and capitalism and elsewhere, and essentially done fieldwork, often STS inspired fieldwork within the field of data, including some of the people from UCL that are present here, including myself. I have also worked in this field and it's uh, absolutely uh, important. So I'm not absolutely going to, in any way, going to denounce it here, but I'm just going to focus on two other strategies and what I'm talking about here today, which is like, what you might call anthropology with uh, big data. Uh, that was something we tried to do in, in the aforementioned uh, example of the party. What happens if you mix with care, as Anders Block and I put in the paper, these different sort of like data sources that at that, least at that point for us were sort of imagined to be entirely sort of disjunct. Uh, we used to sort of uh, the idea of complementarity from Nils Bohr and others to sort of account for the, the, the potential potentiality of a fusion between these data forms, or sorry, a combination with these data forms that did not fuse them, but somehow held both uh, views uh, account at the same time. And, you know, as, again, I think that is really interesting. And I think a lot of stuff could come out also maybe in terms of art projects and intervention in the world, in terms of like combining uh, in, 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 in beautiful and striking ways. Uh, ethnographic data with various forms of computer generated data. Yeah? But I think the last sort of form that I'm more interested in at the moment is what I would call anthropology as big data. I'm not sure that I have or anyone else have fully accomplished to do this yet, but I'm interested in the prospect for the anthropology discipline and also the prospect for computer and data science if this were to happen. So let me just focus a little bit on this kind of project prospect over now. Uh, over the next five minutes or so. Because what, what, what could it be, this thing that you know, where anthropology is something that, it, it, that uses the big data to, to do anthropology rather than looking at them and maybe rather than combining, let's say, ethnography with big data, but the anthropology itself is somehow doing big data sort of methods and, and analysis. What would that be? And I think we can say, uh, with a, a great degree of certainty that the sociologists uh, are way, way ahead of us here. There's an extremely interesting literature coming out of Chicago, Stanford and elsewhere on people trying uh, sort of what you in the old days would call cultural sociologists doing really advanced and I think quite sophisticated, often subtle analysis of a huge data set, text data set scraped from various sources uh, uh, going under the names of computational grounded theory, computational hermeneutics, the geometry of culture, etc. I can't go into these details, but I think these are, we can learn a lot from these uh, quite advanced group of sociologists doing this kind of research. Uh, but like, if we're going to like look a bit like about anthropology itself, I think uh, the starting premise for the, this kind of like thought exercise that I'm trying to do here is essentially like, uh, I think they're quite obvious when you think about the fact that anthropology, of course, is not the same as ethnography at all. Ethnography is a particular form of method, some would also call it a form of description, and Ingold and many others have discussed that over recent years. Uh, but I don't think that anthropology is the same as ethnography, obviously, that's why we have the two words. But I also think that anthropology is somehow bigger than ethnography and also bigger than qualitative data and qualitative uh, methods. So just in the same way as anthropologists are not like have some unique and superior access to ethnography as a method is used by other disciplines sometimes better or at least differently and equally good as anthropologists. So I also think that anthropologists somehow like depart, we should sort of like detach ourselves a little bit from this identity that has somehow collapsed anthropology on top of ethnography. So since I would like to ask, what would quantitative anthropology be? What is quantitative anthropology? Given the fact, as, as you see in this uh, com uh, citation here from a, actually a computer scientist who points out uh, many years ago, she points out social anthropology is one of the least mathematicized and computerized of all the social sciences. But that's a surprising fact, given the vast amount of quantum data that field anthropologists record, classify, and sift. So what could anthropology, quantum anthropology be? I don't think clearly that it would be the same as quantitative sociology in the same way as quantitative sociology is not the same as quantitative economics. 
But of course, it would have family resemblances to quantitative sociology and these other quantitative social science forms. But you know, there are many ways of doing it. But I think the usual way to get there would be to revisit Levi Strauss. For as far as I'm concerned, one of the great masters, not just of anthropology, but of all humanities and social science research. And some of the sort of like at least uh, hopes uh, and you might say dreams or fantasies he had for what could be done were one to get access to sort of to the sort of data uh, that we do actually today have access to in the world, much cheaper and much more readily available. As uh, Levi Strauss put it, that the fundamental requirement of anthropology is that it begins with a personal relationship and ends with a personal experience, but in between there's plenty of room for computers. And essentially, I just want to take uh, the resources very, very literally in what I'm going to talk about for the rest of uh, this talk. Yeah? Um, so, but I think in order to turn the resources dream into a, a reality, I think we need to ask the following question, because this is also important in terms of not just anthropology, but also these disciplines with which it might start collaborating or in order for quantitative or even computational anthropology to come into being. We need to ask, what could anthropology be if it were computational? And what could computer science or data science be? Were, what would it have to be for it to be anthropological? That's to say, I think anthropology and data science must or can be deployed to transform, or you might say reinvent each other. What comes out on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the experimental uh, endeavor of creating a computational anthropology would hopefully be some sort of like, you know, uh, productive distortion of not just anthropology's own foundations, but also that of data science, or at least certain branches of data science. I'm gonna come back to maybe also in discussion what particular branches that might be. It relates a little bit to what I just said about the, the cultural sociologists in Chicago uh, and elsewhere. So a really, really super important thing that has become increasingly clear to me, even just within the last month when I started teaching with, many colleagues from different disciplines in this new degree program, where we have taken in students from many different backgrounds as well, uh, ranging from sociology to computer science, is that, you know, when you start explaining students, but also amongst ourselves, what is actually the relationship between uh, qualitative social science, including ethnography and data science? I think many of us, uh, at least I would have done thought so traditionally, that I would all, all think that you know, qualitative social science and ethnography is somehow uh, located in a very sort of like distant pole, and then data science and quantitative science would be almost the same. You know, that it's just that the data science use some different methods, but really these people are doing almost the same thing. But of course, what becomes clear when one starts digging into things and collaborating with people is that that's not the case at all. I would go as far as saying that there's an equal, that there's an, there's an equidistance, if you like, but the distance between qualitative of social science and data science is not bigger than the distance between quantitative of social science and data science, which, by the way, is probably of the same uh, level of the distance between quant and quant social science. Let me try to elaborate what I mean by that by focusing on the relationship between data science and uh, anthropology. And I think uh, uh, many of you probably have heard about this, or maybe you even have worked with this or, or tried it yourself. But I think it's really important that to when you think about traditional quantitative social science, as many of you know, is based often on a very sort of theory or hypothesis driven form of empirical research where you, you uh, identify some variables that you can go out and test in an experimental setting in such a way that you can get a statistically significant data set produced that will then either verify or not verify the hypothesis has been phrased beforehand. But that's not at all how data science, or at least some or much data science uh, works. Data science actually works much more like, if you like, anthropology, or at least in the way in which we like anthropology to think that anthropology works, namely letting, to use this overused term, the data speak for themselves. Uh, I put this citation up here from Isaac Newton that I have on my door here, that are, so all the economists I work with can be reminded about the fact that, uh, and the physicists, that actually Isaac Newton was a sort of like quantitative anthropologist, if you look at the citation. But I think to be more specific, uh, uh, four ways in which there's an, a very close overlap and a very productive intersection between data science and anthropology. First of all, 
we tend to operate uh, or, or work with unstructured and also so-called found data. That is to say, these are not data that are generated in an experimental controlled environment. They are data from the wild. Uh, if you scrape data from a newspaper, they are produced for another purpose in the same way as ob observations made by an anthropologist during a ritual. Of course, not the ritual was not made for the anthropologist to observe it. Likewise, this newspaper was not written in order for the data science to scrape it. So in that sense, they are sort of, uh, you know, geared towards the, uh, the analysis of unstructured data. And for the, precisely for the same reason, there's a great emphasis on pattern recognition, looking for patterns across without having any necessarily too many sort of uh, preconceived ideas where the patterns might be or where they are. Uh, there's a focus on pattern recognition. And that also makes the approaches in both the uh, sort of uh, uh, both anthropology and data science approaches often very explorative, at least in the beginning. Of course, later on the, down the stage, it might be more uh, hypothesis driven and more controlled, but often there would be a, a sort of like a significant amount of exploration and open minded uh, in the research. And in that sense, of course, it's also grounded. Uh, you might say bottom up, it's inductive, or some would say abductive, but it's certainly not deductive. It operates with, by looking at the data and trying to generate some sort of insight from looking at the data. Whether these insights are predictions, like a, you know, a prediction algorithm that helps you finding out what next Netflix film you cannot help watching next, or whether it's the sort of uh, uh, you know, infer, inference, in, in, inference that an anthropologist will make having observed a number of uh, uh, things happening of a similar kind during a ritual, say, or uh, a length of a field work. That's my claim, and I know it's a, a, it's a pretty sort of like it can be debated, but I think it's useful to set our minds up in a, such a way that we keep reminding ourselves that data science is not the same as traditional quantitative social science, not at all. Yeah? These two can, of course, also be combined, but that's not the purpose of what I'm talking about here. So in order to make anthropology computational, I think we would need to do the following four things. I think we need to, as I already said, provincialize ethnography. We need not to do away with ethnography, but we need to think about ethnography as, uh, you know, uh, in a more sort of um, uh, horizontal manner, uh, sitting next to a number of other potential techniques and methods that we might put into operation in order to enhance and augment and change the analytical and methodological tools of our discipline. But of course, in order to do that, we will have to embrace data science. And so it should not just, but it should still be off big data. It should also be doing big data, using big data to gain its insights and its forms of data. And I think following from that, my claim would be in order to make this reinvention of anthropology and data science, it will of course entail some sort of more or less fundamental rethinking of the entire purpose. And I think also position, including political position of our discipline, including questions of like, such as like, what is critique? What does it mean for a description to be a good description and many, many other uh, super big and uh, difficult questions that I certainly don't have the answer to. So I think what I'm gonna do now is just to briefly introduce you to uh, the overall frame of this new, uh, or relatively new uh, ERC project. And then after that, we'll take a little, whatever we do, stretch our legs, uh, come up with some Q and A questions if you have that, and uh, Hannah will, uh, will uh, uh, be in charge of that part. But let me just spend like three or four minutes before, uh, that short break on introducing the Distract Research Project. So uh, the Distract Research Project, uh, basically, uh, the basic idea about it is to look at Denmark as a sort of laboratory, uh, to uh, a, 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 an optimal laboratory to study what I would call the post-digital society, what happens to uh, a society when the digital has been sedimented into it and for the same reason also become an object of increasing degrees of critique and panic and skepticism without therefore it being less of it before, perhaps even more. So that's the context with which we uh, decided to study what we call the political economy of distraction, or it could also be the political economy of attention uh, in this, uh, uh, in the most world's most digitized country, namely Denmark. And of course, the sort of wider context here is that, uh, you know, we hope probably many of you have maybe followed the new uh, uh, so-called documentary on Netflix, uh, The Social Dilemma. Over the last three or four years, an increasing number of uh, discussions have arisen among scholars and in society about the potential detrimental effects on our attention, and perhaps especially children's attention, uh, as a result of uh, the digital platforms and the sort of 
uh, you know, uh, the, the extreme hegemonic power they, they, uh, these uh, platforms have in our lives. So basically our, our project works on the following number of interlinked, interlinked uh, assumptions, uh, or these, uh, it's not even an assumption, it's more like a, a starting point. So human attention is imagined by scholars or, and uh, people in, in at least in most societies to be a finite thing. There's so, only so and so much of it. In that sense, of course, it uh, resembles an economy of a sort. That is to say, it's imagined to be a scarce resource that is subject to competition and regulation. That is not a new situation. There was also an attention economy during the Neolithic age, many people would argue. But it could also be said that, uh, that it is more urgent now in our contemporary so-called surveillance uh, capitalism or economy in the sort of data economic moment that everyone is talking about. I'm actually quite skeptical about you know, whether there's such a thing in the world as surveillance capitalism, but it certainly is an important context to this project. And we claim that social data science methods, that to say quality quantitative methods that combine anything from ethnography to machine learning, will allow us to explore this scientific and scientific problem in unique and uh, comprehensive ways. And as I also mentioned, the, as the world's most digitized country on a number of, uh, 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 you know, uh, in a number of senses, you could also maybe add the most digitally happy or fetishistic country in the world, Denmark is an ideal lab for conducting precisely such an empirical social data science study. So uh, I'm just going to skip this uh, you know, a little bit more context about the, what many people refer to as the age of attention. The basic assumption here that I used to pitch the project to the ERC and it, it clearly worked is that can we think about attention as the sublime commodity of the 21st century? Is attention essentially the oil uh, of, uh, if, if oil was the ultimate and sublime commodity of the last part of the 20th century, is attention or will attention be the ultimate and sublime commodity of the first half of the 21st? There are certainly indications that that might be the case, considering that the five biggest countries in the world, uh, also the five most profitable countries in the world, essentially make their money on providing so-called free data to, uh, to uh, in the form of so-called social networks, which are really infrastructures for controlling the flow of the social. Yeah? Uh, and of course, we can ask some questions here of a more anthropological kind. We can ask critically, what is a data economy? Is the way in which data economies have been conceived by most of the literature so far inadequate? I'm not going to go into details with that. I'm going to be focusing here just briefly before the break on many, many different kinds of methods that we are trying to combine, ranging from the purely qualitative to the so-called quality quant to more sort of hardcore computational data science methods, including machine learning, deep learning neural networks and what I, including also more traditional quant stuff like surveys, basically by gathering data on, on, on of all these, uh, using all these methods within four uh, uh, sort of areas or domains of Danish society, politics, software uh, programmers, schools, and people who sort of uh, more or less intentionally decide to, to sort of resist the digitalization of everything by moving into communities are regulating in a very hard way the children's access to the digital. By looking at these four fields and deploying these methods that I mentioned before, we hope essentially to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, fulfill the purposes of the, of the research project. And this is basically, I think, the, the last slide I want to show before having this little break. That is the one of the four projects, the one about politics that I'm in charge of, apart from being in charge of the entire project. One of the things we are very interested in here, as I put it there, is like, how is digital attention politicized and practiced in Danish political and public discourse? So including amongst the politicians themselves, we did a fieldwork last autumn in the Danish political party, which was the first party to go out and, and make a sort of anti-big uh, data uh, sort of uh, politics as part of the platform. But of course, in a very traditional manner, one can go in and say, like, what does that mean in terms of the actual practice of the politicians themselves, don't they need to use social media to promote their messages? And how does that conf square with the message they're trying to, to sell? But it's also a matter of trying to trace uh, political attention by using, by combining qualitative and quantitative approaches. And before Corona uh, messed up everything, the plan was to go this June to a major political event, uh, so-called folk meeting, where up to 100,000 people from Denmark gather for a week on an island policymakers, NGOs, 
uh, you know, also representative from the island and the people to discuss politics. And I have made a collaboration with the organizers of this event in such a way that we use it as an experiment to trace and map the flow of political attention in a politic, uh, in the, uh, amongst 100,000 people. I, I can't go into details about how we're going to do that. I hope we can do it next year. But that was the sort of context that we, we were thought we were going to do up until the corona crisis came. And of course, this meeting was canceled. So what I'm going to do now is like going to give the word to Hannah. And she's going to sort of be in charge of what I, I, I presume will be a relatively brief, but uh, probably uh, much uh, uh, you, uh, uh, useful break. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. That was really great and fascinating to hear both about the bigger context for this project and the and to a little taste of what you're going to be talking about after the break. So we thought rather than having a really long talk, we would break this into two halves. So we're going to give everyone about five minutes to gather their thoughts, to think about whether there's any questions that they want to formulate and um, upload to Slido. In a second, I'm going to put the slide back up so that you can see the code for logging onto this website to pose your questions. And if you're in the seminar room and you're close enough to someone to talk at a suitable, suitably socially distanced distance, then you can uh, you can talk to your partner or you know just have a, have a little break. Um, and yeah, we'll come back in five minutes. So according to my time, that's 17:43 UK time. Okay, so in the in the spirit of kind of fairness and democratic participation, I'm just literally going to take the questions that have been upvoted to the top of the list because and also just for practical purposes because I can't see all the questions. So the I'll, so I'll tell you the first three questions then in the list. So the first, the most popular question that has been posed is a great question, a simple question: Why should anthropology quantize? The second question is. To what extent can the approach of computational anthropology replace the use of more traditional ethnographic methods? And then we've got another question. These are all anonymous, so I don't know who's posted them. Um, do you think consumer research tools are the future for anthropology? Could anthropologists use them as a basis for creating their own digital tools? Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me just take the last one first. I, I don't have any specific, uh, I don't know so much what's going on in consumer research, but given that we actually got the idea of focus groups from the consumer researchers, it's likely that there are people out there doing consumer research that combine ethnographic methods with quantum methods in quite pragmatic and therefore maybe useful ways uh, for, for anthropologists. But you know that's all I can say in terms of that. And in terms of the other two questions, and yeah, I I, uh, I noticed that question with the why should we, and especially the should was in in the square brackets because it was probably what I the way I put it. And of course, you know, I think we should, but I don't think it's it's not a normative statement. But if I'm going to give a reason for why I think believe that it would be a good idea, maybe not least for graduate students uh, and younger research, younger career researchers, early career researchers to do so is that I think that uh, it will allow you to have a bigger voice. It will also increase your job chances. It will increase your possibility to be able to collaborate with people from other disciplines who will listen more to what you do. So yeah, I, I, I don't really see any downsides actually to it because I have not myself experienced, but maybe I have been lucky. I noticed the question from Antonia, an old colleague and student of mine, of a similar line, maybe our group is different, or maybe I'm so inclined that I'm not as critical. Maybe I'm not even, maybe I'm just too gullible. But my experience is that working with these people, um, I, I don't wake up every morning and think like, this is uh, potentially ethically really dubious. Actually quite on the contrary, my impression is that by combining these kinds of different data, we can actually get a more precise and often more sophisticated actually more complex picture of the sort of field of uh, object of investigation that we have. So yeah, for me, there's hardly any downside, but of course, and that leads to the third question, should, should and could or will some of these uh, computational things replace traditional ethnographic methods? No, I don't think it will replace it. I think you can use it in a sort of emergency situation to do something either really fast, as I did now in times of crisis, let's say you, 
work for an NGO or for the UN and there's an earthquake and you really need to do some super important but quick survey of something in like the, the, the earthquake side, I think some of these methods can be used for that. But on the more sort of basic research uh, sense, for me, it's an augmentation thing that we need to think about ethnography in combination with these things. And there are many, many different forms of combination. There's just not one. Because, you know, on the one hand, you can use ethnography and uh, some of the economists I work with here, they, they, they use uh, ethnographic data in order to make the machine learning algorithms less biased. Yeah? You can use as an anthropologist machine learning the other way around. You can use machine learning in order to do some exploration of an enormous scraped text data set that you could never in your life read through, however many students assistants you employed on some bad salary. Yeah? So you can actually do what I would call like the archaeology of knowledge. Uh, so many of those things that are not, that I think are methods and ways of analyzing things that anthropologists really use, creating a, getting a sense of a context, a surveying, a, a debate, all those things we can do easily with these tools. But what they can't do is that they can't do field work, you know, and they can't do participant observation, they can't do interviews, of course they can't. And those uh, methods we should cherish. And I, indeed, my impression is that the moment you don't, the moment you don't have so many hangups with working with people from these disciplines, they also start listening to what you say uh, to the importance of these traditional and I think long-lasting methods of traditional ethnography. Okay, well, maybe like picking up on that last point, but there's another question here, which is what's the most difficult thing you find in communicating the value of this computational approach to other stakeholders and collaborators? And you mentioned there that kind of uh, enthusiastic kind of celebration of interdisciplinary working, but obviously that can also be difficult sometimes. So how would you, how do you overcome the difficulties in communication? I mean, there's no doubt that uh, working interdisciplinary is uh, create some specific obstacles. Uh, I'm not even sure that they're bigger necessarily, but they are different from the sort of obstacles you will find if you collaborate with a group of people from your own discipline or similar disciplines like STS or something, that the moment you start collaborating with a data scientist and a, a quantum economist, behavioral economist, of course, essentially, I mean, I've learned over the years that the, the, I do an increasing amount of, of uh, public dissemination of research and I've realized that the kind of language I use when I describe what I do to a journalist is similar to the language I use when I describe what I do to people from other disciplines. So in, this, in the ones one have become familiar and comfortable about using a vocabulary that is of a complete different order, obviously, from the one you use internally in your discipline, then I, I don't actually think that there are any unique obstacles, but the manner in which we I don't, I don't think we're the holy grail. We haven't solved everything, but I think the re reason why it worked relatively well at SODAS is that from the start, the, there was a qualitative anthropologist, uh, myself, and a qualitative STS sociologist were part of the founding group. So from the very beginning, what we call social data science has always been different from what you call computational social science, which is more the combination between quantitative social science and data science. Mm -hmm. You go back to the triangle, it's the equidistance and it's the fact that we actually take, and my, our colleagues here take the anthropologists, at least they pretend, and they're good at pretending it, take our quite seriously, uh, that, you know, that we generate with, uh, if you like, an interdisciplinary safe space where we are allowed to uh, criticize each other without denouncing each other's epistemologies and forms of data. I mean, it sounds a bit bland, but, you know, I would like to give some examples of it, but that would take long, too long time, I think, to, to give. Yeah. Okay, we've got, well, there's one more question that follows on quite nicely, which is um, the a question posed by Patrick, who's asked, to what extent is this type of big data analysis simply a more sophisticated form of qualitative analysis that you would do before any anthropological research? And maybe that like links to what you were just saying about justifying what you're doing in terms of anthropology. I think that's a really good question. I think, uh, and I think um, I, I agree. You you can essentially use these so-called big data to uh, to do just what you did before, but in a more quick and I think also actually more robust manner because it just gives you access to the sort of overviews and the context and information about context. It allows you to target your research much quicker. It gives you a sense of the field in a different way, and you can make 
you can make new sort of like continuous rolling contextualizations of what you do. You can also use this to, to move to and fro a, a computational data set and a, a graphic data set. So in all that, I think actually, you don't actually have to, I think we can call it quality research. That's fine with me, you know, although it is also very big data, some of it, it could be, let's say, the data set I'm getting out of anthropology terms could be, you know, several million or maybe even tens of millions uh, uh, big data set of words. And this is text I'm going to analyze using natural language processing in order to try to say something about how anthropological theory is developed uh, and maybe even predicting, I hope, what uh, how anthropological theory might develop in the future. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I don't know whether that's qualitative. I don't know what it is, but I do think it's worthwhile doing and certainly very exciting. Right, so you're, yeah, it's a kind of de deconstructing and reinforcing a lot of the kind of terminologies that we use in, in our research. So I think that's one reason it's very um, exciting, this area of research, and it's really kind of getting down to the base, the, the, the core of what, what we're about as anthropologists and what our discipline is about and how we can continue that in this digitized, data-infused, saturated world that we're living in. We've only got two minutes left, so it's probably better to use that time to really just say thank you so much for giving the talk today and for bearing with us as we try to work out how to combine our online and offline interactions. I think that worked okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully it won't be too long before you'll be able to come and talk to us in more detail about how the project's developing um, here at UCL. And, not just online. So thank, thank you, you very much, thank Anna, you. all of you for your questions that I look forward to look into. Please get in touch with me. Uh, and, you know, I'll be happy to invite you over here to Sodas. Uh, we are in a sort of like building up phase. And, you know, we are really interested in collaborating with people from UCL and elsewhere on building up this uh, new subfield of social data science. So thank you very much. Thank you. Maria, do you want to say anything? Thank you so much, Martin. <laughs> that sounded good. That sounded cool. That's why I didn't take the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Great. Thank you.